on the board of directors of Metacomet Land Trust and with us tonight is also Ann Hanscom from Oxford. She's also on our board of directors. Uh, thank you for coming. Before we get started, um, I wanted to tell you, for those of you who don't know about what Metacomet Land Trust does, we're a nonprofit charitable organization that does land conservation. We do a little bit of an environmental education every year. And we also, in some towns, work on affordable housing with the town if they want us to. But our main goal is to protect land for water, uh, wildlife, recreation, and passive rec recreation. And we now work in 15 or 16 towns, 15 towns from Webster all the way back to Norfolk in the east. We were founded in 1988, so we're celebrating 30 years of uh, land conservation this year. This is one of a series of events that we're having from now through October. So there's a handout uh, out, out in the hallway with the, some of the upcoming programs that we're planning from now until I think the end of July or August, through August, and there'll be more later. Um, and I also wanted to give a shout out to people here in Sutton. We've worked with the town of Sutton. We've worked with landowners in Sutton, and we're currently working with the Manchog Pond Association and Foundation on a lot of things. Um, we'd love to have more support, um, but we also encourage people to volunteer with either the land trust or with conservation organizations, with the CONCOM in your own town. All of the good work that gets done needs a lot of help and volunteer hours, as Bob was telling me about, about Waters Farm. There's always a crying need for volunteer hours. And I also want to make a specific thank you to the individuals and families which over the past 30 years have acted to conserve their land, particularly right here in Sutton. The residents and businesses of Sutton have now donated to Metacomet over 200 acres here in the town for permanent conservation, which I think is a really remarkable record for the spirit of conservation among people who live here in Sutton. We have 176 acres that are spread out over 10 properties in Sutton, which we own and which are open to the public. Some of them go into Millbury also. And then we have 35 acres of private land on which we have a permanent easement. It's called a conservation restriction. And that keeps that 35 acres also specifically in forestry. And there's another board member of our organization from Upton. Oh! From Upton and Minden, and we're, all, we're filling our own audience here. Uh, the most recent gift to Metacomet here in Sutton was a donation by Stephen Fishman and Ed Shamsey of Sutton Development Trust of a property of 38 acres on Stevens Pond, which had been approved for housing. <clears throat> Their gift preserves the shoreline of Stevens Pond and the view from surrounding areas and also from the pond itself. Metacomet will be working with the Conservation Commission to place a formal deed restriction on this property in the coming months. So there'll be opportunities for town residents to come and support that at the Conservation Commission and then also with the Board of Selectmen. If you'd like to learn more about what land trusts do and how you can help, please visit our website which is www.metacometlandtrust.org, or see me after the program. But tonight we're here to talk about the future, not the past, the future of the woods and forests of Sutton and other towns where Metacomet is active and the surrounding areas of New England. Our two speakers share an interest and knowledge of one particular forest, the Harvard, <coughs> excuse me, the Harvard Forest in Petersham. But they've approached that area from entirely different perspectives. That of an artist and that of an ecologist and scientist. They'll take turns tonight talking about some of the things that they're working on, that they've worked on in the past, their perspectives, and we'll share some time for questions and a dialogue at the end of the night. We'll hear from photographer John Hirsch first, whose book, And Again, Photographs from the Harvard Forest, portrays both the beauty of the forest and the work of the teams of scientists conducting research there. 
John received a professional certificate in photography from the Maine Photographic Workshops and has taught photography workshops in Maine and in Boston. <coughs> He's presently the head of visual arts at Noble and Greenow School in Dedham. Please welcome John to Sutton. Hello. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you to Susan for in inviting me uh, for this and for Jay for coming out and, and talking a little bit. Um, just a little bit of like quick background, um, just sort of how I got here. Um, as a photographer, um, I actually grew up in the Midwest. Um, I did my studying in Maine, um, and this is just one quick picture before we get to the, the like body of, of, the, of the talk. Um, but I would say this is actually the first real picture I ever I ever made, and it's it's in a dairy farm in Maine, um, and it was it was after being sent out on an assignment when I was in school, um, and meeting up with a, a farmer at a fair, um, and he invited me back, and I made this picture in his farm of his daughter Emma Sue in in a crib in the uh, milking parlor, um, and the reason I actually show it is just, in some ways this is sort of how I approach my work is I'm really interested in the idea of exploration, um, and participation, and I'm really curious in in just using photography as a way to learn about the world and, and sort of, it gives me permission. It gives me permission to go explore and do things um, that I know nothing about. Um, so even though I grew up in Wisconsin, I did not know anything about dairy farming before, before beginning this project. Um, it's a little, this slide comes up small. Um, this is the only external picture. Um, this is sort of what prompted this, this project in the Harvard Forest in, in Petersham, Massachusetts. Um, there was an article in the New York Times Sunday Magazine in 2009 that talked about the Harvard Forest and how it was an experimental forest. Um, and that was something I'd never heard of before. I thought the article was really fascinating. I thought the pictures were really lousy. Um, so I wrote David Foster, who is the director of, of um, the Harvard Forest. Um, and that began this sort of, I think about six or seven year collaboration with me going out um, and photographing at the, at the forest um, and talking with scientists and working with them. Um, I'm gonna just read, it's sort of the opening to the book, um, just because I think it gives context for the evening a little bit in, in regards to sort of how I'm thinking about approaching the land and the landscape um, and the work of the scientists. Um, and I think hopefully we'll set up a little bit of what Jay's gonna talk about later. Um, so I'm just gonna read this little passage and then I'm gonna flip through a couple pictures here at the beginning. Um, I learned about the Harvard Forest in Petersham, Massachusetts in the spring of 2009 from an article in the New York Times, The Working Forest. This article by Robert Sullivan outlined environmental research that is taking place in Petersham and introduced me to the idea of an experimental forest. This forest is often described as a 3,750-acre laboratory and classroom for Harvard University. I was fascinated by the description of the work occurring there and decided to photograph the forest the experiments, and the scientists. It became clear to me that this work, was, this work was both visually compelling and material to the contemporary dialogue about land and water use as well as global warming. The forest is a microcosm for the world in which we live and begins, us, begins to help us envision the future we may inhabit. Much of what the scientists do at the forest seems strange and otherworldly to outsiders, but to them it is often a series of mundane acts necessary to gain a larger understanding of the world around them. For me, the repetition suggests ritual and reverence. Um, I began to look for moments where people and place transcended the ordinary, seeking patterns and correlations in the hierarchy of the visual chaos inherent in the forest. The Harvard Forest offers a place where time's passage is more consciously studied than almost anywhere else on the planet. It is a place where technology and nature are so viscerally and overtly entwined that cables and wires emerge from the ground and descend from the sky. Trees are wrapped in plastic and metal and the growth and movements of all things are tracked with unending precision. Like the work that happens in the forest, this work seeks to find a balance between description and intervention. Ranging from pure document to a more lyrical approach, these photographs embrace the descriptive power of details present while acknowledging the ineffable quality of time on place. All right, so full disclosure, I'm not a scientist. I was a psychology major in college. Um, I'm going to go through a little bit of the book, um, a bunch of the images from the book. Um, I'm not going to go through any of the text. There's a, a couple of written pieces in the text. I have copies of the book if you're interested in looking at it or purchasing them later. Um, feel free at any point to just yell out questions um, if you're curious about sort of what you see or if you have any questions. 
Um, but I'll talk to a number of the images and other ones I might kind of blow past a little bit faster. So feel free to just jump in. Um, I start with this one. Um, this is actually sort of the first real image in the book. The other ones are sort of frontispieces. pieces. Um, this is John Sanderson, and he was the person who originally donated the land that is now the Harvard Forest. Um, and this is, so, this is on one of the walls in, in one of the buildings of the forest. Um, and so when I was out photographing, generally what would happen is I would, I would make contact with, with David Foster. So David Foster is the director of the forest. Um, and he was really generous in his, his time um, in regards to spending time with me and sort of explaining what it was that was happening at the forest. Uh, and he very early on put me in touch with a number of the scientists who were working, um, doing a variety of different studies um, about invasive species, about global warming, about carbon nitrogen exchange. Um, and he would put me in touch with people. I would go out to the forest probably once um, every week or two weeks when I was shooting really heavily. Um, I would go out into the forest or into the archives like this, um, spend time with the scientists talking about what they were doing and learning a little bit about the land um, and a lot about what like their thoughts were and why they were doing the work that they were doing. Um, I actually always loved, this is just a stuffed bobcat that sort of guards the archives, uh, which I always enjoyed. I think for me as, a, as an outsider, as somebody who's not a scientist, you know, two things that I was really thinking a lot about in this work is just sort of visual correlations, the way things kind of fit together, um, and also these really crazy structures that scientists were building um, in, in the forest to measure the stuff that they were trying to measure, right? So they're trying to monitor all sorts of things. So this is actually measuring um, the water level in the stream on the right, on the right side. Um, but it's this crazy structure in the middle of the forest that has like essentially a home-built little computer inside that igloo cooler and it's wired to an old cell phone in that top box that records the data and then sends it out via cell signal every, I'm not sure how often, if it's 15 minutes or once a day. Or, um, but again, you know, the idea that you couldn't just go to a local Home Depot and like buy this thing, you had to like put it together. I was kind of fascinated. Um, but I also, on the left, it's a picture of moose scat. And for me, the things that began to happen as I began to put the book together was finding these similarities. So I love the shape of the branch on the left and how it actually mimicked the sort of shape of the PVC tubing um, on, this, on this weird structure. Um, the other piece for me that was, was really important is sort of the idea of mapping. So this is just an electrical schematic of um, one, of the, uh, one of the structures that had a, a great deal of power that was going into to warm the earth. Um, but I love, I love the idea of how we think about place, right? How we think about land and the act of mapping that space, um, the act of exploring that space. Um, so I, I very often was making pictures that in my head were sort of maps of the forest, but often didn't, didn't look um, at all like a map as, as you and I would, would know it. Is Aaron, did Aaron Ellison just finish up or is he still there? He's still there for Aaron's the scientist that was running this experiment, and he was a very funny, quirky man. And he ran into the room where I was working, and <laughs> can't do anything about that right now. Um, and he said, "Do you want to see? I have complete, total control over pitcher plant and the wires." And I was like, "That's amazing. I would love to see that." Um, so in addition to a lot of the um, scientific research that's going on in the forest, there's also an archaeological um, arm of things. So I think there's a school that comes in and explores um, sort of what part of that site was, which was an old tannery mill. Um, so they explore that. Um, again, so much of, of what's going on in a space like the forest is collecting, right? Collecting objects, collecting evidence, collecting data. Um, we may have just may have just lost the projector. Um, is there any way to can we plug into that TV by any chance? Will that projector just now? Yeah. Yeah. It had warned us that it was overheating. Put it put a message up that said clean the filters. Now it says no incoming signal. Yeah. Oh, that isn't very slightly inverted. Yeah, I think it 
much more bad. That's the problem. Yeah, that's definitely gonna be the show. <laughs> um, I mean, I think it's uh, we're small enough that if if we can turn that on, we can probably just go directly into that. Yeah. If, if that's all, if that's all right for folks, yeah, then. Yeah. Yeah. Turn on your internet. Yeah. <laughs> want to reorganize themselves. <laughs> We can turn, yeah, it's easier to turn that on. Flip, flip, uh, you want to blink, flip the other one on so I'm we can see you if you want. Does anybody need to see me? I'm okay with not being seen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay. 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 We'll just, we'll just soldier on here. All the colors are so much better. Um, so this is, uh, I mean, it's a little hard to see at this scale, um, but so one of the things I was actually thinking of a lot about is just how do we pair um, images and how do we move through a body of work like this? Um, and I, I actually, the pairing of these is, is pretty interesting to me. This is this wonderful object um, in the archives where it's actually, it's a wooden suitcase that somebody made by hand and they've cleared this map to. And then what they've done in this, what the legend states basically is that there's, where all those nails are, these are all mill sites. And so this is after the 1938 hurricane, which um, essentially decimated large swaths of, of forest land um, all over the Northeast. And so this is one of the things that helped, actually not helped, it, it really changed the local economy around here with the, with the advent of the local portable sawmill. Um, a lot of ma ma material was built um, to ship produce actually from the Midwest um, as rail, railways were opening up that as a, as a way to get the um, produce out. Um, but so these mill sites popped up all over the place to take care of and sort of monetize all this lumber that went down. Um, but I really loved the way and thought about the sort of shape of Massachusetts mm -hmm. and Cape Cod, um, and then this shape, which is, it's just a dirt trap in the sink. Um, so basically what the scientists were doing is they would be out, they would be collecting soil samples and stuff, they would take what they needed, the little leftover as they were rinsing out the container, they would pour it through. Um, and just this idea of, you know, the thing on the left represents land, um, in, in a, p a certain place, and, and the thing on the right looks like the idea of a map, um, but actually is soil, and just the way they sort of balance each other out with a positive and a negative sort of black and white. Um, there's a number of sort of more abstract images in the body that are sort of um, alluding to, again, sort of some of the ideas of mapping. The image on the left, it sort of always looked like an octopus to me, but um, again, in relation to the sawmill picture, um, that's a tree that they actually pulled down to simulate what a, a hurricane blowdown would look like. Um, so I think they used a come along, um, you know, sort of a winch, and and really crank that thing down again as a way to study sort of what what that would look like. And the tree kept living and grew a new stem. No, I rough? think no, no, the tree died. It's hard, yeah, it's hard to see, but you're essentially that's a second tree. Secondary tree. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, I actually love this. This is just a device literally used for um, looking through a microscope and tallying different kinds of pollen. Um, I didn't realize beforehand, but pollen is, there's all sorts of really interesting information um, that, that you can learn about sort of the, the seasonality of a place, like what's growing, um, what's thriving, what's disappearing. Um, and usually that's done through core samples, um, and a lot of times at the bottom of, of ponds. Um, this is this is uh, 
an important image, I think, in a lot of ways. A lot of the work that, that I was seeing done when I was really shooting early on the project was dealing with the hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, and at the time, it had not reached this part of Massachusetts. Um, so a lot of the scientists were engaged in um, banding these trees, which you can see they're sort of slices taken out um, like a ring. And what that'll do is kill the tree while it's standing. And um, that'll sort of mimic what happens when the, the hemlock woolly adelgid shows up. Um, it will kill the tree, but leave it standing. Um, and so what they were really trying to figure out is, okay, as these trees die and remain standing for a period of time, what's gonna come in their place? Um, and again, that idea of passage of time, um, this is a little bit of a joke to me, but I think it's kind of funny. The idea of like, it's essentially a poster board space in, in the upstairs of the museum. Um, but it, it, in some ways, it's, it's sort of thinking about the land. And I think a lot of the scientists have talked to me about the way land is used and, and how it sort of changes over time. And I love the fact that it's this plain, empty board um, saying trees in the land. Um, but there was something there before, and there's going to be something there afterwards. Um, and I think it's a really interesting metaphor for land and how we use land and, and how we take care of it and treat it. This is actually um, through a microscope um, of a bunch of different kinds of pollen. You cannot see this, but this is an image. <laughs> you can't see it up there either. <laughs> um, it's actually uh, it's a picture of a snow pillow. Um, which So it literally, there is texture and there's a little pine needle which you can't make out on the screen because it's too contrasty. Um, but the, the importance of the snow pillow was instead of gauging snowfall by just having a stick or a container, the snow pillow is really sensitive to weight, so it'll actually tell you sort of the amount of moisture that has fallen over the course of the winter. Um, so this, I think it monitors it every 15 minutes and sends back data on, on the actual quantity of water, um, so it, it doesn't you know, if you have a really light, fluffy snow and you have a lot of it, it you get a very different reading than you know, just a small amount that has a ton of water. Um, this was something I found in the archives. Um, punch cards, pretty, pretty amazing. I also love that it's got that Harvard emblem on it, the Veritas. Um, and again, that idea of truth, you know, like Jay's going to talk in a couple minutes. Um, and, and I think, you know, again, the, the idea of truth for a scientist versus truth for an artist um, means very different things. Um, but in a lot of ways, I think we approach our work in very similar manners a lot of the time. Um, but our agenda is different, right? And, and I think what I choose to show and how I show things is very much about my narrative. And it's about uh, a nonlinear narrative that's not really you know, all encompassing to this place. Um, and it doesn't have a real agenda in regards to like trying to prove or disprove something. Um, but I am really interested in the idea of how we inhabit land and how we take care of it and, and how, you know, what our responsibility is um, um, to, to each other and to a place. This is another sort of, you know, positive, negative. The, the white image on the left is a, um, it's a relief map of Peter's Ham and Harvard Forest. Um, and then on the right, it's just a series of um, tubes that are, that are monitoring different, uh, different gases at different levels in the understory. This is Julian. But, uh, <coughs> um, and again, I think one of the things that was really so magical for me in the process was getting to spend time with um, these scientists who were so deeply invested in the place um, and the work um, and again, trying to figure out how best to care for and, and how best to think about how we exist um, in, in this place. It's just pollen, pollen on the water. <laughs> this is on one of the trails. So I mean, one thing, if you, has anybody been to the Harvard Forest in here? A couple of folks? So if you've had a chance to walk around, there are a couple of great trails. Um, I don't know if this is still out there anymore, but it, it was on one of the um, walking trails that was pretty close to the museum. And uh, admittedly, I'm a little bit of a recovering uh, Catholic, so I sort of see like religious elements everywhere and 
Like I always, I always love the idea of a lot of uh, the scientists sort of almost genuflecting um, in, in this weird altar. In reality, Aaron's just looking for ants. <laughs> There's a sink, and it's it's just a sink that has been used, Copper. yeah, and and has changed over time. Uh, and again, I think that passage of time, and, and both like on the forest, but on the facilities and the people who are in this place, um, was of interest to me. Um, this is Mark, who was one of the people who was really influential in the early years of really helping me meet up with different scientists and spending time with me. Um, again, trying to take a psychology major, major and help me understand exactly or roughly what, what they were trying to do. So in the in the context of the book, um, there are the images, um, but there also are a number of pieces of writing. So there's the little piece that I read in the beginning. Um, there's a really beautiful introduction by, by David talking about the, the history of the forest. And then Clarice Hart really wrote, um, she's the ed educational outreach director. Um, and she wrote a number of pieces really talking about the um, sort of the big buckets of the science that they're looking at and addressing. So what, what was the point of the uh, you know, this is just something I found <laughs> in the museum. Um, it was part of what I think was an, uh, I think it was an old exhibit talking about sort of density of trees and they were sort of doing the dots to represent the number of, of trees in a, in a given area. Um, but again, I, I, I just was really interested in the idea of the sort of construction of this tree um, in the middle of the forest and sort of how how sort of minimalist it felt in a way, <coughs> um, but also how heavy our hand was in making it. So that's that's kind of what I have. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions, or we can we can have a little bit of a, a dialogue at the end, which I can hear from. But if there's anything that jumps out at people right now, I'm happy to try. Can you talk just a little bit about um, where you were at as a photographer before you? I mean, you were there for over a number of seasons. Yeah. So do you, how do you describe how it might affected your own photographic eye and what you're interested in as a photographer? I mean, I think so sort of leading up to this, a lot of the work that I, I've done has been dealing with sort of small um, social groups, um, in a, in a, usually in a, in a particular place and I tend to find people and follow them for long periods of time um, or groups of people and I will sort of be an interloper into those groups. Um, so in a lot of ways the work is very similar and it's sort of a logical progression from that. I think the thing that I really took away from this is just how similar the work that scientists are doing in the field and, and work like this to the way an artist works in regards to sort of trial and error, right? Like the scientific method, like you've got a hypothesis, you've got an idea of what you think's gonna happen, you go out, you do your experiment, maybe the experiment takes a very long period of time, you're accumulating all this data, then you like go back and look at it, and very often you're wrong, <laughs> right? You don't get it right, and so then you have to figure out what are the, what are the variables that I screwed up, or what are the things I missed, or what, what showed up that I didn't expect. Um, and then going back and tweaking it and doing it again. And very much that's the way, uh, I mean, personally that's the way I work as an artist. It's the way I think a lot of artists work. Um, and, and so that idea, coupled with the fact that I really felt that um, as this project was happening, I had two children. I mean, I was out photographing for around seven years, so a lot happened. Um, I had a son and, and he's now eight and I have a daughter who's now five. Um, but also beginning to really think about our impact on place, you know, I think starting in a really localized place in the sense of Peterstown was, was really sort of manageable in a way, um, but also thinking about what are the repercussions of the things we do in our individual places and what that means for the, the greater totality um, of the climate. Um, so I'm actually, I, I'm, I'm very much pursuing sort of art 
in relation to science. So I'm actually taking a, I have a, a residency this fall um, on a sailboat that's going up to the Arctic. So I'll be sailing around, it's an island called Svalbard, which is... Oh, oh in Svalbard. Yeah, ah, yeah. so it's, it's way up there. It's part of Norway, sort of like Puerto Rico is to us. Like it's run by a governor. It's not totally fully Norway. Um, but they also have, I think there's like 16 international science stations on the island, mm -hmm. um, and they do a ton of work um, with a lot of the same stuff, um, to be honest, a lot, a lot dealing with carbon nitrogen exchange, um, warming temperatures, uh, the Arctic, everything is happening much faster there. Mm -hmm. So changes mm -hmm. that we're seeing here in regards to weather patterns and temperature um, is, is, is pretty much very accelerated. Um, so I'm going to be doing some work up there and hopefully making some connections with some scientists um, and, and trying to sort of expand this work in a way. Take your polar bear with them. I mean, well, <laughs> yeah, you can't go out alone. They, they will, anytime we go ashore, we have somebody with us and that person has a gun. Um, so the polar bears see you as food, mm -hmm. which is exciting. More and more. Yeah, because <laughs> they're hungry. I'd be interested in what your, what, your, uh, what kind of equipment you use. What is your photography equipment? Um, so I had a variety of cameras on that. The, the, wow, that's frightening. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was all, all that work was digital. Um, and I was shooting with a combination of cameras. Um, I think I had a Canon 5D Mark 1 and 2 <laughs> over the course of the work um, and then this is all like I part of what I'm doing with the work is also exhibiting it so it, it goes into galleries and, and shows um, so they're they're all pretty big inkjet prints um, so right. um, mostly you know frames around the wall about 24 by 36 or so great thank you Dan. Yeah, thank you Our second guest tonight is Jay Aylward. Ward of the Ale. Oh, great. A research technician at the Harvard Forest who works on implementing the report that's called Wildlands and Woodlands, which is a vision to protect <coughs> land in Massachusetts. His focus is on the ways in which a forest changes over time, very much part of what we just were hearing John talk about. More specifically, how the management how, de how management, deer pressure, and invasive pests influence basically everything else in my layman's terms. <laughs> he has a bachelor's degree from Paul Smith's College and a master's from UMass. He has conducted vegetation studies from Western British Columbia to the Mojave Desert and the Northern Rocky Mountains. Please welcome Jay and do stay for more questions at the end. Thanks. Hi everybody. Hello. So I think, you know, I'm going to try to fake out the machine here since this thing has worked since we turned the TV on. <laughs> and I'm going to try to use the projector here. All right, so I'm Jay Elward. I'm a research assistant with Harvard Forest. Um, I work on mostly observational studies um, under the Wildlands and Woodlands Initiative. Um, specifically, I work under this or for this project called the Sustainable Working Landscape. Uh, and we'll talk to you, we'll talk about that as um, this develops. But this is the cover of the new report that just came out, um, and let's jump in here. So wildlands and woodlands is a big conservation goal, and I love this particular figure uh, because um, it kind of tells it gives, gives me the evidence for like a need for conservation in new england and in massachusetts and i can walk you guys through this a little bit so on the left there we have forest cover on the bottom we have time and then on the right we have population so if you see the forest cover the big dip is about 1850 where we have the least amount of forest cover in new england especially in southern new england so that would be like the peak of agriculture where we are now uh, 
And then as agricultural abandonment happens, we see that forest cover increases, um, mostly giving way to that white pine field succession that we, we see so much white pine out there now today. And then once you get to about 1950, something really interesting happens. We have another dip in forest cover, <laughs> right? Especially here in southern New England, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island. Um, <clears throat> and that dip in forest cover isn't agrarian. It is due to um, development and suburbanization. So that that is forest cover that we're never going to get back as forest cover. And that is kind of what I, f I feel as though is the evidence for needing a conservation goal and needing um, needing to think about how we're going to use our resources as populations grow and, and as we move forward in history. Um, so this is the vision. So uh, our goal is to have 70% of the land in conservation easements. So that's about 30 million acres, meaning in protected forests, and then another 3%, which is about 7 million acres in farmland in active agriculture. Uh, with development taking about 5% of total area, and that's being like infill for the most part. And then within that protected forest area, we have a 10% in the non-managed um, uh, landscape, so basically wild lands. Um, the idea would be, you know, we increase our own, um, you know, we increase the availability of lumber and food um, that we make and make for our own use. So I don't know what the numbers are exactly, but um, we'd be growing more of our own food here and consuming that here and growing more of our own forestry products and consuming those here as well. Uh, so part of the SWL or Sustainable Working Landscape is, you know, our goal is to increase agriculture and forestry, but uh, maintain those healthy, healthy ecosystems at the same time. And the red dots on this map kind of indicate where I have um, field sites and the question are collaborations and then the question marks are um, relationships that we're working on building. So Southern Vermont, we're at the Merck Family Forest um, Center. There's like, a, I don't know how many acres they have, but they do active forestry and active agriculture. If you've never been up there before, it's the upper end of the Housatonic Range. It's beautiful steep mountains and just the diversity of plants because of the topography relief. They also do a lot of grazing of sheep and um, other things. The Blue Hills, that's uh, like a private trust. They have a ton of conservation land as well. They do a lot of active forestry there. Um, it's actually one of the few places where I've been that have actually seen uh, like native red pine, not just planted, just not planted red pine. It's pretty cool. You don't see that very often. The Appleton Farm, which is a trustee's property um, on the North Shore in Ipswich. We've, we've um, been working with those guys to monitor like open land spaces, specifically in the Great Pasture, which has been in pasture for since like 1650 or 1680. So we're looking at um, changes in diversity and plant composition there. And they also go beyond that and they look at birds and butterflies and, and pollinators as well. They have grassland, grassland and bird projects. Yes, they have a, yes, they do a lot with grassland and birds. Did you guys know Russ? Hopping. He's he's. He, if you ever get a chance, he's he's an awesome uh, guy to be in the in the in the field with. Uh, Harvard Forest, obviously, and then we have two sites just outside of Boston. Those sites are so close that the bo the red dots are on top of each other. That's Walden Woods and Lincoln and Concord, and then Weston as well. And that's where I'm spending most of my summer this year. In Southern Connecticut, we have the Highstead Foundation, and I collaborate with those guys pretty closely. And then the question marks conservation groups on Martha's Vineyard, the Franklin Land Trust in Franklin County of Massachusetts, and then Hawthorne Valley Farms over the Hudson River on their side of the Highstead Foundation there in Connecticut. Uh, looking to expand um, and collaborate. And so if you guys know of any other folks, maybe yourselves, who are looking to join, please, let's talk. All right, so most of my projects fall within this long-term monitoring um, scope of research. 
So I get lost in the weeds quite a bit as opposed to like thinking big picture. I'm always like, oh, what is this plan? Or how would I measure that? Or how would I get over there? So I set up these long-term plots, which are um, <laughs> long-term. They get measured like once every five years. You need at least three measurements, right, to get anything scientific out of any experiment. And observational projects usually take a long, long time. But we look at deer scat to try to get density of deer in areas. We look, we have a citizen science project where we look at lady slippers in Weston and stuff. We have white pine needle decline work, WPND, which uh, is a, it's, for, it's like a suite of four fungus that attack white pine trees and we have various infestations of that around New England. We use, Needles on the forest floor? Uh, it means more needles on the forest floor earlier. Okay. Yeah, we can talk about that in a second. Uh, a lot of deer work here. Tentalis is a USFS protocol. We look at hemlock woolly adelgid and treatment within the forest, deer exposures, and open land stuff. So this is Lincoln and Concord. This is where I have uh, 150 or so. Um, long-term plots. Each one of these dots represents a 20 meter by 20 meter square. I have delineated out in the woods and have measured everything from uh, ground level stuff all the way through the canopy. And these long-term plots, like I said, they only get measured once every five years. But what's great about having these out there is that we have like an infrastructure that will be of spots that we can go back out there and we can piggyback all these other research on top of. So each one of these plots I try to do deer scat or each one of these plots I try to do white pine needle work, that kind of thing. So our deer scat and dens uh, deer density work, we uh, collaborated with the state um, and some other deer and the Forest Service uh, and tried to like, we figured out, a, we tweaked a method that the state came up with for the quabbin to use our long-term plots to go out there and measure deer, or count deer scat and then try to figure out density of deer. Um, which is pretty uh, dicey at times because you have to do this like right before, right after the snow comes off, but right before things green up. So you kind of have a small window because the method assumes 100% um, counts, you know, so there's no like nothing missed. Uh, so usually like this year it started in February because we had that really warm February. And then all of a sudden March we got hammered with like three storms like three weeks in a row. So that kind of shut it off until May. And then we had like a week before things got green. So this is like one of those things where I'm really trying, like my, th my second year doing it this year, and I'm like really trying to figure out how to get like more plots, and I need more people on the ground to do it, but you know, resources at a time of year is pretty tough, because I have a lot of, I can hire a lot of students, but they're not a lot, they're not really available at that time of year. Uh, following closely on the heels of deer scat uh, is this um, citizen science project where we partner with the Weston Garden Club, and we've, I don't know if anybody's been here, been to Weston before, but they have a lot of really great conservation land out there, and they have all these trails. So basically, we've assigned certain trails, transect numbers, and then these re these volunteers go out um, sometime late May to mid June, and they count lady slippers, they count number of flowers, they count um, the amount of deer browse they see. Uh, and this happens in 11 conservation areas. We have about 129 trails, and we do 20 feet off either side of the trail. So we're covering a lot of ground. Uh, and this is just some of the raw data that we have. And this started in 2013, but that was a trial year, so we're not really using that. But we count about 2,000 individual plants a season, and only about uh, between t 3 and 30% of those actually will flower. And then we have pretty low levels of deer browse, somewhere between 3 and 9% on veg, and then 2 to 3% uh, flowers being browsed by deer. And the idea was that this is on the deer preferred species list. So, you know, if the deer see this, they're going to they're gonna mow it. Uh, so we wanted to try to track these dynamics over a long period of time, which is pretty cool. So this is like one of the longer term projects that we have going. And Are you going to be able to correlate that with the deer population? Uh, that's... Oh, you're not doing deer. It's a different spot. Yeah, so huh? this year we uh, attempted to do the Weston plots as well. I have about 100 Dynamics plots in Weston as well. 
the, the snow messed us up, you know, we just couldn't get out there to do it. Mm -hmm. um, the idea would be that we'd be able to correlate this, and I'm trying to get that up and running, but 2014, 15, we don't have any deer density numbers, so we don't really know. Um, and now they allow bow hunting in Weston on conservation land, with like with a special use permit and stuff. Um, okay, but <coughs> can you get an idea from the hunters? Well, they sh harvest about 30 deer a year. There's about 30 collisions a year with cars. Uh, with our deer density numbers that we did in Lincoln, we're somewhere between 20 and 60 deer per square mile. So we're way above any kind of healthy levels in terms of vegetation regeneration or anything like that. Um, the problem with you know, hunting in the greater Boston area is that where are you gonna hunt? There's just- well, bow hunting you mean. Yeah, but even still you need to be, you know, so far away from a dwelling or a road or a house and you start putting those buffers on your map and it's, you know, you're very limited unless you get permission from private landowners, which many of which are not open to it, you know, and that's a big- We're seeing, I see a lot of damage in very rural areas of what the deer are doing just your house shrubs and stuff like that. The yeah. There's no place for them to go, but they're there. Yeah, they're there. They're, they're very close. Yeah. I mean, you know, but, but it's, uh, the, citizen, the citizen science project's a lot of fun, you know? I mean, you're in the woods, you're looking for wild orchid, and this orchid is not rare, so like you actually can find it, and it's like, it's just exciting. And, um, you know, for my research, uh, kind of digging into the natural history of this plant and like kind of how it lives, it seems like it's more reliant on sun exposure than it is um, anything else. And that these colonies that we find are persistent, are persisting underneath this closed canopy forest, but probably were established when it was op more open. And other past work um, has seen that when like the canopy is removed, these plants do really well. Mm -hmm. And they do really well with um, reproduction as well because they're reliant on big pollinators and large amounts of big pollinators. So when you remove that forest canopy, say like, I mean, not that a gypsy moth outbreak is positive, but when you have a gypsy moth outbreak, you know, that canopy is removed. Um, these plants can bulk up, for so to speak, and then they will flower, like they'll have a banger year next year of flowering, but also all those iracaceous shrubs under in the, in the understory, your blueberries, your huckleberries, they're all gonna put on a lot of flowers and those, those shrubs are what draws in large numbers of pollinators. The lady slipper is a non-rewarding plant, which means it attracts insects, but it doesn't have a reward for those insects. And the size of like the big, those big carpenter bumblebees and those big, big bumblebees are what pollinates these. They learn that these are non-rewarding in one to two visits. Mm -hmm. So you need to have a lot of them in the area in order to really have any kind of popular or any kind of reproduction happen. So, I mean, this plant, I mean, it takes eight years for this thing to even, like, grow to flowering size. It's just, this plant is crazy. Anyway, so, uh, this is part of the deer work we do. Uh, and then following that, this is also time sensitive, the white pine needle decline. So, this, this, these four fungi, they attack third, second, and in bad and worst cases, first year pine needles. Um, it's been shown to reduce productivity in white pine by like 20%, which is a real worry for a lot of people since white pine is a really dominant plant in our forests. Is that what you see? I see so many of the older big white pines browning up. Yeah, if they're browning that, up this time of year, and if they're browning up, um, if you're looking at your white pine and it's like brown, like from the bottom up, then it's most likely white pine needle decline. If it's just kind of spotchy here and here and here, it might not be because the way the fungus spreads is through rain splatter for the most, most part. So usually it works its way from the bottom of the canopy up through it. So a lot of the places that I work, um, you know, I think the deer are having an influence on what's in the understory and they don't eat white pine, they don't like black birch. I see a lot of white pine and I see a lot of black birch in understory forests. White pine don't do that well in understories. Mm -hmm. So they're already kind of stressed to by you know, light and resources. Um, so they're more susceptible to it already. And I see a lot of those understory white pine heavily infected. Um, this is Southern New Hampshire, this photo. 
Um, I work with the UMass Extension Service. I use I, I work with the UNH Extens Extension Service on this, in the uh, USFS. Um, this photo is from Western Mass. This is in, taken in Florence. This pine stand is heavily inf infested, infected. Um, but you know, this stand in particular, it's all 80 feet, all, all 80 foot trees. They're all like 12 inches in diameter, so they're in super tight quarters, so they're already stressed out. They should have, so this stand should have been thinned about 40 years ago, and these, and these trees have been better, are probably in better shape. But white pine makes up a huge component of our, our forest resources here in New England. And this is kind of a close-up shot of a small tree, so you can see all these nubs where these fascicles would attach all the way down. So this seedling, like all of those fascicles, all those leaf scars should still have needles attached. Um, but you can see that this tree's been relieved of everything except for the very, the needles that hadn't, haven't even matured yet this season. Uh, that's kind of a close up of that. And this is a close up of what the fruiting bodies look like. And we see, I mean, there's like four fungus that make up this group. Um, if you talk to the extension service at UMass, they won't make a call unless they can grow it. And we haven't, Nick and I, we haven't gotten our stuff together to grow these things in his, in his incubator yet. But next season, we'll probably figure out what actual funguses we have out in Weston. What, what was the effect? Last year is the first year in my memory that the Gypsy moss, when they finish the oak, went to the white pine. They will, they'll do that. Right, and renewed in like 80% of the white pine. And now this year they're not needling out at all. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure if, if those, how stressed those trees are. I mean, if they're, if they got hit by this and then they got defoliated, they, they might be pretty stressed out. Uh, so those are the kind of like my time sensitive early season stuff. So like once, once middle, late June ends, like I can no longer do the white pine work because those needles are dead and they fall off. So you have a hard time seeing where the infection is. So then I move in back into deer land uh, and with the, you know, we work with the forest service uh, using their 10 tallest technique. So basically I take all those, I have all those long-term plots. I go out there and we look for two preferred species and two non-preferred species um, that are chewed on by deer. And then we just measure them until we find the 10 tallest ones within that 20 meter by 20 meter plot. And for each specimen, we're also rec rec um, recording whether or not it's been browsed. Uh, and then we're also recording the number of individuals within that plot to give us a sense of density. And the idea behind this long-term work, you know, is, excuse me, it's not necessarily experiment ex experimental, but it's, you know, we're going to be able to see shifts over time, you know, so like, and then I take that matrix of long-term plots and we did them all last year and this year it's like, well, let's only do the ones we have four species in. And then it's like, we're going to continue to do that same set for the next X years. And it's like, all right, well, this plot used to have white oak in it and there's no longer any white oak in it. Or there's, we're down to five white oak. We can't even fill the top 10. So that kind of gives us a sense of like, what kind of influence the deer are having on understory plants, if any. And to get, you know, experimental, we've set up these deer exclosures where we take a two inch by four inch welded wire, four foot rolls by a hundred feet and um, put up deer fences. So basically I can get about, I can get just over an eight foot fence with, with these fences. We have about 20 that are kind of general region fences that are like in different forest stands. And then we had a forest fire come through the east side of Sandy Pond um, a couple years ago. So we got to set up fences in the fire and a control area outside of the fire to test whether or like what the influence is on fire and deer browse on regeneration. And these are pretty fun to build and maintain. Uh, so I'm looking for four trees to be my corners and for those four trees I mount two by fours and then attach the welded wire to that, put T posts out, we're clipping the folks posts together and stuff. And um, within each fence, we have a seven meter by seven meter plot. And then in that big plot, we're measuring the height of every single seedling and root species. So we're like 
you know, really getting into the nitty gritty of what's what's out there and what's and what's what's happening. Um, and then in the smaller plots, we're looking at cover class and um, individual heights and that kind of thing. Um, these are these are really fun, and they're not too expensive to put up. Um, and the the trick with these with these guys is you just need to have somebody that can check on them once a month. Um, in order to like maintain them because things do fall out of trees and hit them. <laughs> and so eight foot tall with that uh, material keeps the deer out. So you, have, you haven't found any deer getting over your eight foot? No, so you know, the deer can jump over eight feet, but if these plots are like roughly 10 meters on a side or these fences are roughly 10 meters on a side, so that's small enough to where they don't know if they can get back out again. If these were like say, 20 meters on a side or 30 meters on a side, so a really big square, they they would they might jump it. Huh. But since they're small enough, they found like I mean the researchers that we work with have found that if the if the fence if fence and area is small enough, an eight foot fence is adequate. And if you go really small, you can get away with a shorter fence. But you know we need to work in there and get something big enough to like actually measure something. Where's the funding come from? These fences. Um, are funded so we we set up a bunch in Lincoln Conservation Commission land so they um, funded a bunch of theirs the town did, the town did yep and then um, the uh, forest fire experiment that's a collaboration between Harbor Forest and um, Highstead so we split the cost of those and the ones in Weston the Conservation Commission funded these this method is um, pretty inexpensive in terms of um, deer fencing construction. You can do three for like 800 bucks. And that gives you material left over to maintain as well. So if you can get bodies on the ground with a little bit of expertise, you know, I mean, you don't need to, I mean, I sink the two by fours with ledger locks with an impact drill and then Everything else is hand tools, pliers and hammers and post pounder. And then Hemlock Willie and Delegate is the other thing that I do a lot of work on. So this photo is of a site that's David um, Orwig. He's a research ecologist at Harbor Forest. He focuses a lot on heart, uh, Hemlock Willie and Delegate. This is one of his research sites. This is 90% uh, mortality. You can see that these huge hemlocks have been wiped out. And you got a picture of the uh, the woolly tufts where it gets its name there in the bottom left hand corner. That's where the insect lays its eggs, so it doesn't fall out of a tree. Southern Connecticut and the southeast, I think the mortality rate's like 90% once it gets in within its forest stand, so you know, pretty high mortality. But in Lincoln and in Weston, they treated there's this big. I don't know if anybody's been to uh, the Codman Estate. It's like uh, it's. I think it's owned like the estate itself is owned by Historic New England, and right behind it butts up con town conservation land. Uh, and Weston and Lincoln worked with a um, arborist who was willing to do this stuff at cost because he was really interested in in saving the hemlock. Uh, so they treated a four-acre hillside of every tree that was bigger than like 24 inches in diameter. And this is just a picture of the stand. These are, this is my crew a couple of years ago measuring crown diameter. Um, these, these trees are, are big, and I, and I haven't really seen this in Eastern Mass much, um, where we're looking at like 80 to 90 centimeters in diameter, 125 feet tall, just big, beautiful trees. Um, and I think it's, you know, so much of the, so much of what we see out there in the woods today is, because of what happened in the past. And, you know, the history here, I think, is um, it was like a wealthy landowner and they didn't cut this hillside for whatever reason. Uh, so these trees are really big and they're really beautiful and they've treated everything that was big with a root injection. And so I've been monitoring this site. I mapped every stem. We've done. Um, tree height, crown height, crown base, lowest limb measurements, uh, DBH, mortality, light transparency, that kind of thing. And what's really interesting is they treated like seven years ago and 
um, the treatment only stays in the tissue for like five years. So there's no insecticide left in these trees. But every time a big limb comes down or like a top falls over, like we comb through it looking for woolly adelgid because we're like, well, wh why isn't it here? Where, why hasn't it come back yet? You know, because the, the understory hemlock that they didn't treat is newt. It's like, it's all dead, you know? So it's around. And, you know, we can't find anything of, except for the uh, elongated hemlock scale, which is on the needles in the, it, the treatment that you use for um, HWA doesn't, kill anything that's on the needles, only what's like feeding off of the stem there. What is it that you use? If I could pronounce it, in in, uh, it's a neonicotinoid root injection. Um, yeah, I can't stumble through that without reading it. So, sorry, I can... But neonicotinoid. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can give you the name of it afterwards. Um, a lot of controversy around that. And what's interesting is like, you know, we have this chat a lot, um, you know, with other scientists and, and at the forest and stuff. And it's like, you know, people are really worried about the pollinators and the neonicotinoids, but it's like, there isn't a lot of pollen, there isn't a lot of flowers happening in a hemlock stand to begin with. So it's like, we wonder what the effects are actually within a hemlock stand. But that's experiments that I can only dream of setting up. And the problem is the pollinators don't know where you put in your stand. Well, right, but there's nothing flowering. Well, there's very little flowering in the hemlock, so they're not really feeding on anything in there. So, I mean, that's that's you know that's the back and forth argument that happens almost on a daily basis when, when the stand is discussed. But they haven't treated it in a long time. They're not. It doesn't seem like they're going to retreat. Um, for, for concerns that, that you're raising now. Um, but what's interesting, it's still super interesting that there's no woolly adelgid on these, on these trees even though there's no insecticide left. And there's some kind of relationship between woolly adelgid and the scale where if these trees are heavily infested with the scale, the adelgid has a harder time getting reestablished and there's the thinking is that the scale changes the chemistry of what the woolly adelgid feeds on, so it's no longer as, as appealing. And I, and I don't know about the effects of scale on these trees. Like I've talked to some people who are like, oh yeah, elongate hemlock scale causes hem hemlock mortality, no questions asked. And I've talked to other people who are like, oh, we don't even worry about the scale, it doesn't, it doesn't do anything. They can persist through that, no problem. I don't know. You know, time will tell. But it's the thought that the tree may have been prompted by the treatment to develop an immunity. I don't think we can, I don't think that's the case. Yeah. Because we have seen other stands and other trees that have been treated, and as soon as the insecticide's gone, the hemlock will adult it back. So we were, everybody that was part of this project a couple of years ago was pretty panicked, like, what are we going to do? Like, those trees are going to get taken out and then like we're looking and we're like well you know these crowns don't look awesome but they don't look terrible either you know so I just wonder if there's some kind of balance there and what and what that's what that looks at uh, and what's really cool about that stand too is one of my field crews from a couple of winters ago uh, is that white pine that's in this hemlock stand uh, we cored that and that dates back to 1784 and that was cored at about five feet because the base was so rotted. So this tree was like, you know, definitely around in 1776. It's just so so cool to like be out there and see these old trees and be within this this cool context. So just kind of what I what I do, that's kind of my field schedule and, you know, it's from spring to fall. The hemlock stuff usually happens in the fall and um, winter. And my life in the woods and uh, I'd love to hear Questions, comments, concerns, and um, so yeah. Do you, do you analyze the uh, hemlock tissue for the insecticides? Um, I haven't, no. Yeah, that might be interesting to do to see if there is maybe for some reason that was hanging around longer in the tree than you expected. I wonder, yeah. I mean, you know, the, we're basing that information off of studies that have looked at that, but you know, every site's different, so maybe there is something there. Um, 
it's kind of a it's kind of a steep slope. It's pretty high and dry. So I don't I don't know what that would how that would push it one way or the other. But there's a hemlock stand just on the other side of the swamp from this one that we have all, we're also monitoring, and that one has not been treated. And those trees look okay for the most part, and their roots are wetter. So I'm not sure, you know, I'm guessing that they are able to like kind of buffer the, the delgid through access to water. And they're not as stressed out. But like when I first started in that stand, like you'd walk through the understory and it would just be like, you know, you'd see this hemlock just, you know, this tall and it had more white on it than green, you know, it was just like, whoa, this is, I mean, this is heavy infestation. Um, and is this, this, this is, these, the big hemlocks are which species? The Suga canadensis, so the eastern hemlock. Eastern hemlock. Yeah. Okay. And if you let them grow, they'll get that big. You were. Or bigger. Bigger. Wow. Yeah. I've never seen over many years. Many years. Many years. But I, I've never seen. Well, in the. What's the um, the trail at at uh, Douglas State at Wallen Lake? There's a hemlock. There's a huge hemlock. Huge Swamp Trail? Yes. And that's... The Cedar Swamp Trail. Th that's Cedar Swamp. Are those... Okay. Are those cedars or are those... Are they hemlocks? Or we have a big hemlock gorge in Franklin, but I don't know how big the trees are. It's... I mean... I don't know how, the, how big our biggest are around here. Yeah, I don't... I mean, like, we have... There's a stand at Harvard Forest that's um, right behind the Shaler Hall. It's on Prospect Hill, and that has some mass, I mean, they're dead now, but like it has some massive hemlocks in it. And I was, I started working um, as a seasonal employee at Harbor Forest in 2011, and that was the year that I first saw those hemlocks. And I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. I, I, you know, I stayed on through the year, and the next summer I was like, whoa. And then the next summer they were dead. And I was like, wow, that was a fast turnaround. Those are big trees, you know? Really interesting. How and tall are they? The ones, those ones that are massive hemlocks. The ones at Harvard Forest, the ones in Codman. Um, Harvard Forest, I'd, I'd be guessing those are over 100 feet tall. I haven't measured their height. Has anybody looked at the fact that once a tree gets to be a certain height, that gravity out, outweighs the, the possibility of slow up? Sure, yeah, there's a lot of work done on that. Um, yeah, sap flow stuff, especially at HF. But the woolly adelgid kills <coughs> from the tiniest seedling to the mightiest of hemlocks. Um, and we did an initial, like a pilot study in that stand I'm talking about at Harvard Forest where we were like going through and we were cutting freshly dead seedlings with a pair of nippers, bringing them back to the lab sanding the end and looking under a microscope and counting 25 rings. So something that was two inches tall was 25 years old. And that, I mean, those hemlock trees are just survivors and they're, you know, this foundation species, they influence so many things around them in the forest. It's just, you know, such a conundrum, you know, do we treat them, do we not treat them? Like we can't treat the forests. I mean, like, you know, Lincoln and Weston are unique opportunities that, you know, Basically, this guy was like, "Hey, I really want to save the hemlock. I'll do this for I'll do this for cost." I don't know. It's really interesting. You know, it's interesting how how our communities are going to shift over time. And if you look back at the pollen record, like um, John was talking about, like you know, they take these cores out of these wetlands and then they like break up the cores by centimeter and then they sift through the pollen and identify under a microscope. You know, five thousand years ago, there was a huge decline in hemlock. Like, are we just like... And then they regroup? Yeah, and then they regroup. So, like, was that... What was that? <laughs> you know, we don't know. And maybe we're living through that event right now. Have they, have they ever looked to see, like, uh, like certain spores or mold come at certain times? Like, like with the chestnut, like the elm, you know, they have, like, almost like a system... This one comes through, wipes everything out. This one comes through, wipes everything out. Because we're seeing that pretty much everywhere that 
certain trees will just be devastated by certain things, and then something else will come up fine for no reason. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. It's like almost like a warped s succession, though, you know? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I'm, it's, I'm here to observe, Too many you know? Animals. I mean, I, I think at the core of this, having the protected land to be able to witness is, you know, going to be really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, just I, throw it I, out there. I came tonight... I was hoping for a direction when you were entering to about how to address my own property, which is just shy of 30 acres, and I, I have a conservation interest in it and a farm. And it, um, it, it was a farm and deforested in the early 1700s and um, was uh, dairy cattle. And until Erie Canal was built, and, and then it's reforested itself, just like the exhibits at the Fisher Museum. <laughs> yep. You know, so that uh, uh, on certain parts of it, where it's hard pan, it's oak and some maples, but um, maples are going where down by the river, and the rest of it is white pine, mature white pine. And um, I keep looking at it, and I see that there's so much damage to the oak from the fishing rod. I mean, I must have a dozen hundred-year-old oaks that are now dead. And the, the pine trees, the, obviously, it's the rot, you know, the uh, diminishment of the needles. The WPND. Right. <laughs> and so the whole the whole understory is tiny little caliper, small caliper pine seedlings. They're probably pretty old, but they've never gotten anywhere because they're in the dark. Right, yeah. I'm and and something is uh, you know attacking them. And as a landowner I try to decide, should I get those out of there because it's a huge fire hazard? Mm -hmm. Or knocking them down and then they're just a higher fire they're a horizontal fire hazard instead of a vertical fire hazard and I, you know I, I'm looking for direction on how to how to understand the changes and develop a, com a, a, a plan to cope with it mm -hmm. so well I don't know what your conservation restriction has on it but you know, if I was in your shoes, I would I would talk to a forester and see what they say. Because what happens with these overcrowded pine stands is that they they just are their own worst enemies because mm. they get overcrowded and they don't they can't go anywhere and then they just get super stressed and then they get sick and then they go right. even less right. further, you know. Um, so, you know. In, so much of like everything, everything that's on our landscape right now is like an effect of some kind of land use yeah. history. Yeah. I mean, all the way back to the glaciers, you know, right. like there's, it's always been something here. And, um, you know, I talked to, I talked to a lot of people who are like, oh man, I really just, you know, I don't want to do anything with my land because I just want to have that like old growth characteristics and stuff. Well, and it's yeah. like, well, yeah, maybe if we really reglaciated and then repopulated in that same way we would get that same thing in, in a natural process which would take thousands of years <laughs> right you know like yeah <laughs> that's so cool but you know i mean yeah i mean i think i think a good state certified forester would be willing to work with you and and try to figure out what your goals are and, and work with you to develop those and a lot of it comes down to cost right and a lot of that can be comes down to cost. Lay on me. With the loss of these different species of trees over the years, the elm, the chestnut, the hemlock, what's the next tree that's going to be taking a hit here? I don't want to make that kind of negative prediction. Well, <laughs> you'd almost have to say that the, the oaks are pretty devastated right now. If you drive around in our area, 
we'll have to see what the the uh, gypsy moss have done. And what's but it, what's it's, it's scary just to see how many huge trees are near roads and yeah. what's in the forest that's completely dead right now. But it's really interesting that those events are seem to be really localized. Yeah. You know, right. so like. But um, is it moving? Yeah, you know. Um, gosh, I don't want to say no, but you know, we looked at a map of uh, defoliation last year with the gypsy moth, and where it hit, it hit really hard, right. but it only hit in very small places. And then we were geared up this season to, um, well, it was all dependent on what, what was going to happen this spring with moisture and stuff. <coughs> right. I'm not sure right. where we stand that with that. That changes a lot. Yeah. I'm not sure where we stand with that right now. Because right. I, I was amazed to see, uh, I thought that they were pretty much done with and going back in some areas and seeing it's totally wiped out all over again. And that's three years in a row yeah. of, of losing a good, good section of the forest. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I've been doing... Um, during the winter, you know, I've been doing a lot of coring of trees and doing some dendrochronology work. And, you know, I'm measuring rings and, you know, if the tree is healthy beforehand, it can take a few defoliations mm -hmm. before it get killed. Um, so the question we want, we might, the bigger question might be like, what's stressing these trees out to yeah. begin with? So. That could be a change in the soil structure. Could be, yeah. yeah. And the rain cycle, the, the seasonal cycle of moisture as well as temperature and amount of moisture is set when we get the moisture and when the tree needs it. Yeah, yeah. There's all these factors that could factor into that. But I mean, I, I hate to try to predict what's going to die next, you know, because that's just not the way I want to look at it. No. <laughs> it can't be known. It well, can't be known, and you know, I mean, we still have trees out there. We still have full forests, you know. I mean, from a diversity standpoint, yeah, we have probably fewer tree, fewer species that are going to be in the crown I've or canopy trees. I've heard that the, the guess is that the trees that will endure climate change and all these pests that have the, the proposed greatest possibility is the hickory hmm. and um, I'm wondering what it is about the hickory that foresters are thinking it's going to be it's going to have the capacity to get through this and I wonder if it's because it's got such a long taproot it can find water where other trees can't could be could be I, I'm, I'm not sure Thank you both for coming. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, everyone, for coming and for Jay and Don to coming the long distance as they came today for a relatively small panel. We really appreciate oh, that's it. That's fun. Yeah, well, thanks for coming, guys. Thank the you. Wildlands and Woodlands, it, does it have its own website? It's it does, yep. So he didn't bring he didn't bring extra copies of it. If you don't have it and you'd like to see it, um, it's wildlandsandwoodlands.org, I think. Yep. Yeah. And it might be listed in some of the materials that are out. You can. Yeah. If you go to Harvard Forest website, it'll show up there. Right. Right. And there's a new version of it that's online, as well as the earlier. The new report just came out this year, so. Right. Yeah. Well, thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Yeah. Lock the building doors.